The Hits. Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And our stories are written especially for people learning English. Here are the stories we have for you on today's program. First, the education report. Dan Friedel talks about what awaits students going back to university in the United States. Gregory Stockel brings us a story on religious leaders and COVID-19 vaccinations. I will return with this week's words and their stories. Today, I will teach you some sweaty expressions. John Russell tells us about a Dutch museum that uses technology to make sure everyone can enjoy art. And finally, I will return with a story from a distant part of Alaska. But first, here is Dan Friedel with the Education Report. After over a year of teaching by video, American colleges and universities want to open for in-person learning. Some are requiring their students to have a COVID-19 vaccine before they come to school. Most will ask students to wear face coverings inside. Some schools, however, have changed their minds. They are concerned about the fast-spreading Delta variant of the coronavirus. Both the University of Texas at San Antonio and California State University at Stanislaus had planned to open classrooms to students. But recently, the schools announced plans to delay in-person study until the middle of September and early October. Cal State Stanislaus said it needed more time for students to send in proof of a COVID-19 vaccine. In San Antonio, the university said a sudden increase of COVID-19 cases required a change. The university hoped the number of cases in Texas will drop by the middle of September. The Chronicle of Higher Education listed about 750 universities in the United States that require students to show a record of vaccination. The schools are mostly in the western and northeastern parts of the U.S. In Republican-led states, school leaders face political pressure to limit their antivirus actions. The governors of Florida and Texas issued orders to ban public schools from establishing requirements for vaccines or face coverings. Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. is opening to about 7,000 undergraduate students this week. As a private university, Georgetown can make rules without government interference. It requires all students, teachers, and other employees to be vaccinated. And everyone must wear a face covering to go inside buildings. Sue Lawrenson is the Vice Dean for Undergraduate Education in the College of Arts and Sciences at Georgetown. She said Georgetown has planned for the 2021-2022 school year since last spring, when vaccines were not readily available. So, other than the vaccine requirement and students being permitted to sit close to each other, all other plans stayed in place. Most classes will be in person because 
Our goal is to have as many in-person experiences for our students as possible, Lawrenson said. As part of the plan, classes are being held in rooms where there is more space for students to spread out. However, that means some large classes with hundreds of students will not take place in person. Those classes, she said, are homeless. The big classes and a few others will take place on video. Lawrenson gave two examples. A small Italian language class would be hard to teach, with students sitting far apart and wearing face coverings. Another class, First Year Microeconomics, has 300 students. There is only one room on campus that can seat 300 people, but that leaves no room for students to spread out. So it will also take place on a video call. Of course, we wish we were welcoming everyone back to campus in fall 2019 conditions, um, but it's not fall 2019. Uh, It's fall 2021, and the Delta variant rages, and we are fully aware that we need to be flexible and nimble. Lawrenson said she thinks any Georgetown class that is done by computer and video in 2021-2022 will be much better than the same class a year ago. That is because Georgetown's Education Center, the Center for New Designs in Learning and Scholarship, helped professors learn how to make technology a part of their teaching. A year ago, Lawrenson said, professors had to learn about internet video call systems. Now, they know the technology and have experience teaching online. I think as we move into fall 2021, um, our faculty are more experienced with online teaching. Our students are more experienced with online learning. Our faculty have the benefit of having done this a couple of times now, and they also have the benefit of lessons learned. Even with the changes, Lawrenson said she is excited to welcome two classes of students to campus this fall, those who started at Georgetown last year but had to take classes by video, and those who are first-year students. Georgetown knows many students are looking forward to getting back to sitting next to each other and having casual interactions, but in-person learning will be an adjustment for students used to taking classes by video for over a year, Lawrenson noted. The university tried to make it easier for students by running a small summer program for those who will be starting their second year. About 500 students attended. It gave them a chance to see the campus and get a sense of what life is like in Washington, D.C., The truth is, we are better prepared than we've ever been to pivot if we need to. We're not planning for it, but we're prepared for it, if that makes sense. I'm Dan Friedel. Next is Gregory Stockel. The Bible Belt is often used to describe an area of the United States, mainly in the South, where people are deeply religious. As a result... Religious leaders could help or hurt the campaign to vaccinate people in areas affected by high infection rates from the fast-spreading Delta variant of the coronavirus. Some clergies are holding vaccination centers and praying for more shots. Others are against the vaccine or not talking about it at all. Recently, the First Baptist Church of Trussville in the state of Alabama had an outbreak following its 200th anniversary celebration. The church's leader promised more cleaning and face coverings. 
but he did not say the two words that health officials believe could make a difference. Get vaccinated. Dr. Danny Avula is the head of Virginia's COVID-19 vaccination effort. He suspected he might have a problem getting religious leaders to publicly support the shots. Members of his church called them the mark of the beast. It is a saying to describe loyalty to the devil and the church's teaching. A few religious leaders have gained crowds or media attention for their opposition to the vaccines, like Tony Spell. He repeatedly ignored COVID-19 restrictions to hold in-person church services in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He told followers vaccines are like the devil and urged them not to follow the government's evil orders. Curtis Chang is a church leader who also teaches at Duke University. He said most clergies stay silent on the vaccine issue to avoid tensions in religious communities already struggling with the pandemic and political division. The National Association of Evangelicals, a group of Christian leaders, found that 95% of its members plan to get vaccinated. But Chang said many leaders have not spoken in support of vaccination. This matters because vaccination rates are generally low across the Bible Belt where many churchgoers resist appeals from government leaders and health officials. In the state of Missouri, more than 200 church leaders signed a statement urging Christians to get vaccinated as cases exploded last month. They noted the church's teaching to love your neighbor as yourself. The mayor of Springfield, Missouri, said the area saw a big jump in vaccinations after the leader of a large church told followers that it was the right thing to do. Dr. Alan Eaton is an infectious disease specialist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She said churches could be effective at supporting vaccination as a way to love your neighbors during this pandemic. Next to their personal physician, many here in Alabama routinely turn to their church leaders with health issues, she said. I'm Gregory Stockel. Now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Sweat, those tiny drops of perspiration that make up part of our body's cooling system. We sweat when we do hard physical work. We sweat when we exercise. In these situations, we can say we work up a sweat. For example, running is a great way to work up a sweat. We also sweat when it is hot outside. But we wouldn't say we worked up a sweat. We didn't do any work. We just got sweaty by being hot. We often use another verb when talking about sweating, break. For example, when I helped my friend move to her new apartment, I barely broke a sweat. That is because she doesn't own very much. 
I just needed to help her move some books, kitchen items, a box of clothes, and a cat. Now, there are other situations when people may sweat. When we are very scared, nervous, worried, or simply uncertain about something, we could sweat. If any of these feelings go to an extreme, we might say we broke out in a cold sweat. For example, people who do not like to speak in front of strangers might break out in a cold sweat if they have to talk to a large crowd of people. Sweating can also be a sign that you are unsure of your ability. That is why one popular advertisement for underarm deodorant had this famous expression, Never let them see you sweat. Sweating could also be seen as a sign that you are lying, or at least not telling the whole truth. If you watch crime shows, sweating is one thing police look for when they question a suspect of a crime. Now, sometimes we use the word sweat in a strange way. Let's say you help someone do something, but it was really not a big deal for you. The person thanks you, and you can say to them, no sweat. This just means it was easy for you to do. But I would only use this with someone I know fairly well. Here is another strange expression. Don't sweat it. This is a way of saying no problem or don't worry about it. Here's a quick story. One time, my roommate and I decided to have a stoop sale. This is a fun way to get rid of stuff and make a little money. It also gives you a chance to see people in the neighborhood because the stoop is the front area of a building, the part with the steps. In the morning, we worked up a sweat carrying all the items down. But once things were set up, we could relax and talk to people who stopped by. It was really fun to get rid of things we no longer wanted. And by the end of the day, we had earned nearly a hundred dollars to spend on a little party for everyone. It was a really hot day, and during the sale, I sweated up a storm. So I took off my favorite jacket and set it aside. By the end of the morning, I couldn't find it. My roommate asked me, was it the black jacket with lightning on it? Yes, I answered. She quietly said, I think I sold it. I could tell that she felt badly. So to make her feel better, I said, Don't sweat it. It's not a big deal. Come on, let's order pizza and drinks. Inside, though, I must admit, I was a little upset. It was my favorite jacket. But those feelings did not last long. There are too many serious problems in life, so it is important to not get upset about small things. In other words, don't sweat the small stuff. Here is my last note on usage. While sweat and perspiration are physically the same thing, the two words are often not used the same way. We do not say perspiration in the same informal way we say sweat. So, with all of the expressions we heard today, we only use the word sweat. We would not say we worked up perspiration or broke perspiration. And we definitely would not say, don't perspire the small stuff. But if you make a mistake, don't sweat it. 
And that's it for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Now, let's hear from John Russell. The Utrecht Central Museum in the Netherlands offered an unusual art exhibit this month. Called The Blind Spot, visitors could look at artworks as expected, but they could also touch and smell them. The show was designed to provide a better experience for museum-goers with poor eyesight. The creators made copies of famous paintings and added representative elements that could be heard or smelled. Visitors could even get a feel for the art, which included touchable elements. Visitor Farid al-Mansuri seemed to enjoy his experience. He smiled as he moved his hands over cheese, grapes, and bread, part of the representation of a famous 1610 painting by Flores van Dyck. The first thing that struck me was the smell, Almansuri said. I could really smell the cheese, and I touched it, too. Almansuri wondered how the food did not fall from its unbalanced position. That was really surprising to feel. I guess it was glued on pretty well. Almansuri said. Artist Jasper Uding Tenkate and designer Yeren Prince created the blind spot. They said they were inspired by an experience they shared with a blind visitor at a past art show. They had provided food to go along with an artwork at the show. The blind visitor was very moved by that, they said. That moment was the starting point, Tenkate said. Steffi Maas is the museum's head of inclusivity. She said the blind spot was an experiment on the way to more such improvements. Visitor Bas Surland also praised the blind spot, calling the experience quite unique in the Netherlands. I'm John Russell. Halfway between the United States and Japan is Alaska's Adak Island. It is one of the remote Aleutian Islands. It is a place known for its natural beauty. The coast is home to rich wildlife. Purple lupin flowers can be seen along roads through grassy hills. Hot springs cover the landscape. Snow-topped mountains and the Great Sitkin Volcano rise in the distance. It is also a strange place, with an important military history. ADAC became a U.S. Army Air Base during World War II to protect against a feared Japanese invasion of Alaska. The base was later used by the Navy. Because of its closeness to Russia, it remained an important military base and submarine lookout center throughout the Cold War. Adek Island is home to the native Aleut people. It is not easy to get to. It requires a four-hour plane trip from Anchorage. People visit Adak to hunt, watch birds, climb mountains, or examine one of the many abandoned military bases. American writer Nicole Evett recently described her travels there for the Associated Press. She describes two Adaks, one filled with beautiful nature and one filled with Cold War military remains. Like many other historical areas on ADAC, the old Loran, long-range navigation, station, is covered with painted words, called graffiti. 
and it is falling apart. The doors and windows are broken. Evett calls the inside of the buildings spooky. As she walked through dark, partly wet rooms, paint was coming off the surfaces, and broken equipment sat in disrepair. Through broken windows, she saw the blue-black Bering Sea crashing into nearby Horseshoe Bay. This is the ADAC experience, equal parts spooky and breathtaking natural beauty. But the real reason to visit ADAC is not the military buildings. Most people come to hunt caribou. The animal was introduced to the area in the 1950s as a possible emergency food source. Along with hunting, people also come to hike. There are many beautiful hikes on the island. One at Finger Bay offers views of the volcano. A hike to Lake Bonnie Rose includes an old abandoned military building built into the hills. At Horseshoe Bay, brave people can climb down a rope to the coast below and nearby hot springs. At Clam Lagoon, you can watch sea otters, harbor seals, and sea lions playing in the water and warming themselves on the rocks. For bird watchers, the area is wonderful. And Adak's strange national forest is also worth a visit. This is a small collection of evergreen trees in an otherwise nearly treeless landscape. In town, fewer than 100 people live full-time in old military houses. These houses sit in mostly empty neighborhoods with other buildings in need of repair. So why do people stay? Some love the quiet. Others say they feel safe from the coronavirus. Some get extra pay for remote work. People who live there often do many different jobs. One man who serves drinks at a bar also works at the airport. ADAC locals learn to live with very limited supplies. The only food store is in the old daycare center. It is open just a few hours on some evenings. The old high school and middle school now hold City Hall, a health care center, and the post office. A drink store that was once a gas station sells a case of beer for $50. In most states, a case of beer is under $20. Food choices are limited. Restaurants and stores are often closed. One eatery in ADAC does not open often, but when it does, it serves a large pizza for $28. Reporter Nicole Evett wrote that it was surprisingly tasty considering how far the tomato sauce and cheese had to travel. And that is our program for today. Thanks for listening. Some content in this program was provided by the Associated Press or Reuters News Agency. Don't forget to join us again tomorrow to learn English with stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo.